we thought we'd begin today's summit with a unique and somewhat provocative look at the future of America. Juan Enriquez is a futurist, researcher, and venture capitalist who explains the connections between science and technology, social evolution, and public policy. He'll offer his perspective on the future of our society and show us why we ought to take the long view. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Juan Enriquez. Thank you. Good morning. Let's go up to the first slide, please. All of you know the story of Paul Revere, right? So he wandered through warning, the British are coming, the British are coming, and people paid attention. That was a good thing. And it turns out that a modern Paul Revere looks like this. And he's been wandering around, and he's been saying, hey, folks, the debts are coming, the debts are coming. And he's been doing that for decades. And of course, even though he's been warning about this stuff, nothing's happened. And usually in polite capitalist society, you don't quote Lenin. But of course, Lenin came out and said, there are decades where nothing happens. And then there are weeks where decades happen. And you can accumulate debt for a decade, and you can accumulate for two decades, and you can accumulate for three decades, and nothing happens, and nothing happens, and nothing happens, until, of course, the European Union begins to figure out what happens when your debts get too big, when you promise too much, and, don't, and you overspend, and you end up with taxes that look like 75%. And if you think of what the life of a minister in the European Union looks like, and what it's looked like every month for the past several years. This is what they spend their weekends doing. Right? Now, you can call this Iceland, or you can call this Portugal, or you can call this Spain, or you can call this Italy, or you can call it Greece, or you can call it Cyprus. But basically, you overpromise, you overspend, you overtax, and you spend your weekends trying to make sure the entire European Union doesn't go off a cliff. And those are the consequences if you don't act. Those are the consequences if you say for decades, oh, it has nothing's happened, and nothing's happened, nothing's happened until it does. And as you're thinking about that, what's been happening in the United States is mandatory spending, when the Peterson Foundation started thinking about stuff like this, was relatively minor surgery. So you were sitting here basically at 38% of the US federal budget. Today, what you're looking at is about 64% of the US federal budget. And as you look towards the future, the future is beginning to look like this. So what was minor outpatient surgery is becoming major surgery. And soon it's gonna be critical surgery. And if you've got a debt problem, you don't fix the debt by doubling or tripling the debt. So let me just show you what one trillion in $100 bills looks like when it's stacked up. Please note the gentleman sitting on the left of this picture who's about six foot tall, right? So that's about a trillion bucks. Now here's what's been happening in the US with the federal gross debt. So you take about 1.3 of these stacks in 1983, you take about 4.4 a decade later, and then you take about 6.8, and then today you're sitting at 17.2 of those stacks. And by the time you project this forward, by 2040, you're talking about almost two times the GDP of the United States. And you've got to ask yourself, is that sustainable, or does it begin to look like one of these really fun European weekends? As you go through this stuff, and we enter a debt trap, it's really important that you start reading documents like this, which are not the usual language of the Federal Reserve subsidiary boards. They are normally very taciturn, boring documents, and they do not have headlines like deficits, and debt, and looming disaster. But what I want you to note on this document is that this is an old document. This is from 2009, and it was talking about this crisis when the debt was $10 trillion, not when it was $17 trillion four years later. So as this system goes forward, let me just remind you again, 
It doesn't seem like anything happens. It doesn't seem like interest rates go up. It doesn't seem like this debt matters. Because we've got a lot of disciples of the fictional French economist, Jean-Francois Loulou. And the disciples of Mr. Loulou advocate and say, you can have two major wars, you can do them for decades and not pay for them. And at the same time, you can give yourselves a major tax cut. And at the same time, you can increase benefits for all. And it will have no consequences. And when these disciples go through those new TSA machines at airports, the ones that do full image body scans, you can always tell the disciples of Jean-Francois Loulou because they look a little bit like this. Now, as you're thinking about this stuff, and as you begin to see signs that look like this, one of the things that Michael has just said is there's not much difference in the short-term projections between the government and think tanks on the left and on the right in terms of what happens over the next few years. And all of them, left and right, see a way going forward. It's painful. It would have been far less painful five years ago, 10 years ago. This is not pleasant trade-offs, but it's doable. And it's doable without the types of crises that you've seen in Europe. What is not sustainable is the current policy, which takes us in this direction. It is better to act now. And as you're thinking about what acting might look like, it's a series of compromises and it's a series of trade-offs. It's not either or. Because either or is too darn expensive. If you do it only as cuts, what you'd have to do is you'd have to cut 28% of the US GDP. If you do it only as revenue, then you'd have to increase revenue as 38% of the GDP. And by the way, there's a third thing you've got to do, which is as mandatory spending starts crowding out everything else in the economy, then you can't fund growth because you can't fund brains. There's no money left to fund education, to fund R&D, to fund infrastructure. So it's got to be a combination of you've got to fund stuff that is going to create growth. You've got to have some increase in revenue, and you've got to have some cuts. And it's a moderate compromise in those three things that I hope takes these two new Paul Revere's into a new direction. Because what I would love to do is I'd love to take this fiscal summit in a year in two years, in three years, in this direction. Can we just please get on with it? Let's put ourselves out of the business of discussing the fiscal deficit and start talking about things which are really important, which are the long-term trends. Because right now, this fiscal debate is taking all the oxygen out of the room. You're either on this side or you're on this side. And you have all kinds of fights about stuff, which is reasonable compromises that have not happened. And when you do that, what ends up happening is you don't understand the truly important transitions that are taking place because you're focused all day, all the time, just on the deficit. And you might be missing the big picture. Here's what the big picture looks like. Humans are the only species on Earth that transmit data consistently to their kids across time. So maybe a dog learns commands, maybe a parrot learns words, maybe whales have songs, but there isn't an animal on Earth that writes on cave walls except a human being. And why is it so important to write on cave walls? Because look, this is how you have a baby. This is the fish we eat. This is how we cook it. This is how we dress. This is how many of us there are. These are our little in musical instruments. And you just learned a whole lot about what was happening in Argentina 2,000 years ago. And as you think about how we transmit knowledge, that's enough for a tribe. It's not enough for an empire. Why? Because here you have to go to the cave to learn what's going on. An empire, on the other hand, looks like this. Two things have happened here. You've standardized the language, and you've put it on paper, papyrus, or clay, which means you can transmit data across time. And you can also learn the lessons of why Egypt fell. All of you clearly know that you can read that, right? It basically says, cut the deficit, <laughs> right? And then what you do is you standardize language, you make it abstract, you put it in 26 letters, and it looks like this. And you can have huge libraries. You can transmit data across time. And of course, in this, you can write little sentences that say, Psst, cut the deficit. <laughs> 
And then what's happened over the last 30 years is you collapsed all language into ones and zeros. That's the single greatest creator of wealth humans have ever seen. It's the countries that understood this transition because they weren't focused all the time on current problems, but were looking at the future, that generated an enormous amount of wealth. You want to understand the rise of Silicon Valley, of Taiwan, of Boston, of Korea, of Singapore, of Bangalore, India. It's that transition right there. Why? Because the first line of code says, I love you. The second line of code there says, I hate you. Difference between love and hate, green or purple. What have you done here? You've collapsed every word written and spoken in English into two letters and French, and Cyrillic, and Aramaic, and Egyptian, and Japanese, and Chinese. Every language in the world collapses into a two-letter alphabet. And by the way, so does every bit of music, and every photograph, and every video, and every film. And that transition in code is what's generated most of the big companies that you look at. And it allows us to write sentences like this. Guess what this one says? Cut the deficit. And as you're looking at this stuff, and as you're looking at this transition, you can take the world's first trillion operations per second computer and put it this year into an Intel chip in your computer, which gives a street salesman in Mumbai as much information as the President of the United States had 20 years ago. Take all those satellite images, take all those maps, take all those bios, it's in your smartphone. And as you begin to think of those transitions in the economy, what's really important to understand is this transition took place really quickly. So the world was basically 98% analog in 1986, and it's about 98% digital today. And you blew up Polaroid, and you blew up Xerox, and you blew up all these enormous businesses, but you built some enormous businesses if you were paying attention to this transition. Here are the top 10 fastest growing US industries for the last decade. You want to understand where jobs are? You want to understand where growth is? It's countries that spent money on education and infrastructure as codes transition. Every single one of those has to do with this transition of ones and zeros. And as you're thinking about this, you're all a very competitive group. Let's try the following experiment. See if you can get more answers than your neighbors on this question. For the next 15 seconds, come up with more than five large US companies that didn't exist 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. Just think them through. All right, now tell your neighbor how many you came up with and see if they have more or less. All right, now for the winners. Here's a bonus question. Do exactly the same thing with five major European companies that didn't exist a decade ago, two decades ago, or three decades ago, and see how many names you can come up with. That one's a little harder. You want to understand why there's 40% unemployment in Spain? You want to understand why there's huge debt crises? Partly it was because there was no growth, not because there aren't really smart people. Partly it's because there were no startups. Partly it's because they spent on a whole series of mandatory spending items and didn't invest in the future. And as you think about this stuff, job growth only comes, at least in the United States, from startups. It is not the Fortune 500. It is not the Fortune 50 that generate net new jobs. It is this startup economy because people are investing in the future. They've got dreams. They invest in this stuff. And there's support for education, infrastructure, R&D. Now let me tell you about the current transition. So again, we're transitioning the code. So we move from hieroglyphs to ABCs to ones and zeros. And now what we're doing is we're transitioning in DNA. So about 60 odd years ago, Watson and Crick begin to argue that all life is coded in what they call a double helix. So this double helix of DNA has four little rungs in it. It's adenine, theanine, guanine, cytosine. 
which means all life is coded in four letters. Every orange, every sheep, every cow, every human being, every politician, they're all made of the same stuff. And as you're thinking about this stuff, you can write incredibly boring books. You can write trillions of letters of this stuff. Now, why is this stuff important? Because it means this orange becomes a diskette that executes code. How's it work? Well, it's pretty simple. It does this. And when it does that, it begins to execute code. And it says A, A, T, C, A, A, G. And that means make a little root. T, C, G, A, A, C, C, make a stem. A, T, C, G, G, make some leaves. T, C, G, A, A, make some more oranges. Remember those little ones and zeros? Zero, one, 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 I love you. One, one, zero, I hate you. It really matters which string of ones and zeros you send. Same thing with life. A, T, C, A, E, orange. G, T, C, A, E, this becomes a grapefruit. C, G, A, E, this becomes a lemon. G, C, A, E, maybe it becomes a watermelon. You change one out of a thousand letters, you become the person sitting next to you today. Be more careful where you sit next time. So as you're thinking of the consequences of this stuff, it turns out life is code. And if life is code, we can read it, we can copy it, we can edit it, just as we do with ones and zeros or words or hieroglyphs. Which means you can go and visit these two scientists in Argentina. They will introduce you to their friendly pet cow. As you're petting this cow, these two nice creatures show up. And you say to yourself, hey, self, you know what? Those two look really similar. Well, yes, they do. Because if you take the cow genome, which is in each of the cow's cells, which is the entire gene code of that cow, you can take that gene code out of any cell in the cow, stick it into a fertilized cow's ovum, and give birth to two clones. This is what cloning looks like. So this is a vet, left hand way up the back of the cow, placing a bunch of cloned embryos. In the morning, I was taking these pictures, which is why today on the Argentine Pampa, there's a lot of cows that look really similar. Because I did not expect to find this in Argentina, I'm running around taking pictures with my digital camera until a very nice gaucho shows up and says, pero che, que estas haciendo? Why are you taking so many pictures? Don't you understand? They're all the same. So here's stage three of life code. Stage one, we read the genome. Stage two, we photocopy it. Stage three, we edit it. This one was born a few weeks after I took those pictures. And this one's important because they edited the genome. They didn't just copy it in such a way that this animal produces a medicine used to treat cancer in its milk. It produces erythropoietin, EPO. And 20 of these animals substitute for this factory right here. How we make things and where we make things are going to fundamentally change. And in the same way as for the last 30 years, those countries that didn't just focus on things like the deficit, but invested in the future, invested in education, invested in R&D, and had startups, became the powerful countries on Earth. The same thing is happening now as life code begins to make its way across the economy, because how we make things and where we make things is going to change in a fundamental way. Now, of course, no red-blooded American would ever want to be treated with a medicine used or created in Argentine cloned cows, which is why Americans are using goats. These are goats in Western Massachusetts producing a FDA-approved medicine. They're worth about a million bucks apiece. As this stuff moves forward, this is beginning to move through college campuses. And college kids are beginning to ask the question, can you simple biological systems be built out of standard interchangeable parts and operate in living cells? And the answer is yes. So what these kids have been doing is they've been building everything that you can build in electronics, but they've been building them in cells. So all the switches, mathematical compilers, et cetera, et cetera, that you have in a computer chip, you can now build in a cell. And oh, by the way, you can now build it in a robust system, which means you can copy, which means you can make this standard, which means you can build all the things that make a logic circuit in a computer on a cellular scale. Now, what are the consequences of being able to do that? Well, about 
five years ago in a bar just across the river here after about three scotches. These two guys, one more person, Dave Kiernan and I, sat down and said, wouldn't it be really cool if we could program cells just as you program computer chips? And we decided to found a company called Synthetic Genomics. Now it helps when your partner, the guy with the beard, is the guy who sequenced the human genome, Craig Venter. It also helps when the guy sitting down won a Nobel for restriction enzymes, Ham Smith. And a mere four years and $32 million later, we're able to take this picture. Why is this picture important? Because it's the first time you transform one creature into a completely different creature. You make one species into a different species, which by the way, some people thought were the, was the world's first synthetic life form. And the cover of 4,800 papers and magazines and the science discovery of the year. And why is this interesting, not just as science, it's interesting because there are two big differences between what happened over the last 30 years with digital code and what's about to happen. The first difference is you can make anything that you program the cell to make. So you can program the cell to make gasoline, so you can program it to make vaccines, you can program it to make textiles, you can program it to make information storage, you can program it to make foods, and we're doing all of that. But the second big difference is this software makes its own hardware. So it scales. It doesn't matter how I program a computer, I'm not gonna have a thousand computers in the morning. But if I program cells, they go from those little test tubes and we come back to our little greenhouse in San Diego and they begin to look like this. And now what we're doing is we're buying a little tiny piece of the Imperial Valley and here's what our factory is gonna start looking like. And some of those will make energy and some of those will make textiles and some of those will store information and some of those will make a whole bunch of other stuff but we're gonna go through a really big transition in how and where we make things and let me tell you about the second big difference, the speed with which this is happening. So the cost of sequencing a full human genome dropped in four years from nine million bucks to 10,000. It's now 5,000. That's a decline factor of 800 times during a period when computing dropped by about four times. All right, so this is happening a lot faster than what happened over the last 30 years. In fact, Moore's law is in white. The cost per genome has dropped off a cliff, which means we cannot build computers fast enough to store this, to transmit it, to triage it, which is one of the reasons why Amazon is now 17% of the cloud, because everybody's uploading this stuff. That's why companies like IBM, not just startups in the People's Republic of Cambridge, are interested in this stuff. This is the reason why you begin to see ads like this at General Electric, talking about gene code and information storage. And oh, by the way, life sciences and healthcare are now about 14% of GE's revenue, and that's why you see genomics and proteins and cell discovery and bioprocesses at GE. And why DuPont is beginning to make all of its stuff not out of petrochemicals, but out of cells that are programmable, that make plastic. And by the way, life sciences is now about 42% of DuPont's total earnings. These are big transitions in the economy that are taking place very quickly, not just here, but also abroad at places like BASF. So here's the bottom line. You don't have to invest a lot of money. These startups that start small and become the big companies in the United States, it's 0.2% of GDP invested through venture capital backed companies. But these companies are now about 11% of US jobs and 21% of US economic output. You wanna address the deficit? Start investing in this kind of stuff. Understand these transitions. Don't cut research budgets for R&D by crowding it out with a whole bunch of current spending. So here's my specific plea. Can we pretty please just get on with it already? Right? Can we quit talking about deficits and start talking about the future? You want to keep this country as the greatest power on earth? It's about investing in the future. It's about understanding these transitions. It's about letting kids dream. So let's change the conversation. Because at this point, it's a painful operation, but it's doable. And it'll take decades to get it done. But in Europe, it's become absolutely critical and the survival of some countries and their sovereignty is at stake. Let's just not reach that point, okay? There's too many other things to talk about. Thank you all very much.